Coming up today on David versus Goliath. You know what? Not only do I believe I can do it, I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Movies called Dogs, Dog Food, and Dogma. Talking about dogs, kibble, and low carb. Welcome to today's episode of David vs. Goliath, a podcast dedicated to helping small businesses leverage technology to not only help them compete against their large competitors, but win. Your host is currently the CEO of Anthem Business Software, a free time Inc. 500 recipient and a serial entrepreneur with a passion to help small businesses everywhere find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. Please join me in welcoming your host, Adam DeGrade. Hey everyone, it's Adam DeGrade with another fantastic, hopefully summer edition that's sunny outside for you of the David vs. Goliath podcast. Today I have Daniel Shuloff from Keto Natural Pet Foods. I guess dogs eat low carb too. Had no idea, but we're going to find out together. Today's episode is brought to you by Anthem Software where you can find, serve, and keep more customers profitably with their all-in-one solution of software, CRM software that is, marketing services to get results, and also a training lab to help you grow your business, all built specifically for small business. Take the tour today at anthemsoftware.com for a 120-second video tour. You will not be disappointed. Also, be sure to visit us at davidvsgoliathpodcast.com. You can subscribe to receive our newsletter, and you can also apply to be on the podcast. We look forward to having the applications. We've been getting a ton, and we're very, very grateful. Two personal items. Don't forget about my book on Amazon. It's The Adventures of Jackson. It's a cute kid story made specifically to help them learn about bravery, gratitude, and attentiveness. And also my album, The Calm is finally out. My piano acoustic album with a string quartet. I also play acoustic guitar on it, designed to just help you chill out and relax. You can find that wherever music is served up to you. Make sure you add it to your playlist, stream it, download it, buy it, share it, link it, tweet it, whatever it takes, I appreciate it. And if you like it, leave a review. If you don't, be kind. And uh, we appreciate everyone who watches and listens to the podcast. Well, with no further ado, let's get right into it today with Daniel Shuloff. Daniel, welcome to the David versus Goliath podcast. Thanks, Adam. It's good to be here. I'm so glad to have you. I know you're temporarily housed up there in Park City, hanging out with some dogs, which makes perfect yes, sense for your business. Um, and I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was We've ch- got six dogs up here right now. You know, we have four dogs in our home in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, my girlfriend's mother has two dogs of her own. So we've got a pack of six up here right now. Oh, my word. Good for you. You know, it's funny. Yeah. I was checking out your site. And obviously, you're the CEO and founder of Keto Natural Pet Foods. And I had no idea that dogs need to eat low carb for themselves as well too. So when I got the request to have you on the podcast, I said, man, there's no better David versus Goliath than a gentleman who's starting a natural pet food to compete with the large pet food conglomerates out there that have dominated pet nutrition for years and years and years. And I thought it was interesting because you could tell that you clearly loved, the video you have on your site is great, by the way, the six minute video where you talk about you know, the health of animals and how they don't really even have the ability to digest these things. I had no idea. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a veterinarian. So anything that you you hear in the show, I mean, don't take my word for it at all. But I thought it was interesting to actually hear your story. Um, And, you know, for the watchers and the listeners, this is primarily a business podcast. We're going to dive into your business pretty good. But before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about why you decided to do this and what the purpose of the company is for. Uh, Sure. So basically the story is once upon a time, I was an intellectual property uh, litigator in the city of Atlanta. I was basically grinding, doing business to business, uh, patent and trademark and uh, trade secret disputes. And it was a super cool job. I don't, I'm sure you know some lawyers. There are difficulties about the job. 
Um, but it was super cool. But I mean, among the difficulties are uh, your grind as a junior type person, the grind is real and there's no sense of equity being developed. It's like when I looked at my bosses that were the ones who had done it totally right, right? They were the top of their profession. They were guys that had um, a really good sense of work-life balance from my view. They were the guys that did it as well. If I could just nail it 100%, I'd end up like them. And there's, there just, it didn't seem like they had it that great to me. They had, they were still like the concept, basically like the economics of legal practice in the U.S. right now is built around this concept called the billable hour, which is basically another way of saying your work doesn't scale at all. It's like you will, even at that age, you know, when you're a senior partner, you'll be, your salary is going to be much higher, but you're still putting in just as much time in order to be valuable to the firm. I didn't love that right around that same, and this is like circa 2011, right around that same time, I had read the uh, Tim Ferriss book, The 4-Hour Work Week, and it really resonated with me as I'm not like, frankly, a huge fan of the dude, but like that concept of like setting up a micro business, you know, remember this is pre pandemic, pre zoom. Um, and even like the e-commerce economy just like wasn't quite as developed yet. So this was pretty revolutionary stuff for me. The idea that you can set up a micro business that is highly automated and that would allow freedoms like working remotely, traveling, uh, habitually, um, that kind of stuff from a place where I was working in a non-scalable profession was very attractive to me. And so that's the business side of it and the personal like outside of the doggy world side of it. That's how I was teed up for for making a change. But I got my very, I was raised with dogs. My mother bred dogs when I was a kid and I've always liked dogs, but I got my very first like my own dog around that same period of time as well. And he was a Rottweiler. He's since passed on, but he was like this big, intense Rottweilery Rottweiler. And in order to make him a polite member of society, <laughs> he had to get like some daily bout of exhaustive exercise. And um, two things basically happened as I was struggling to like make sure he could get enough exercise to not kill anybody while also working, you know, 14 hours a day at this law firm. One is I found a toy that worked super well for dogs like him that I realized wasn't being marketed success like very well and that I could do it better. And I decided to basically see if I could set up a micro business that, that in the four hour work week style that was basically grounded around a similar but better version of that product. And what it was is something that allowed the dog to exercise really effectively without people being involved. It's like these huge hard plastic spheres bigger than a basketball. And for a dog like him and for other dogs that just have like this neurosis where they just have to like kill and dominate things, it's like a, it just he could play with it by himself to exhaustion. You put it down outside and they try to like wrestle with it with their paws. They can't break it. They can't get their jaws around it. And so it's like they're wrestling with another dog at the dog park by themselves. You could just check email or drink a coffee or whatever while it's going on. And then in the course of doing that as well, basically, I came to understand how significant a problem, the problem of obesity is among pets in the Western world. You know, like obesity and exercise are kind of just like overlapping phenomena to some degree. And so as I was reading the literature regarding exercise and trying to understand how to exercise my dog better, I like came upon facts about obesity and it just kind of blew me away. Like basically... There's two facts. Whenever I talk about this, I like highlight these two same facts. Number one is more than half the dogs and cats in the country right now are overweight or obese. So if you pick the next one you see at random, you're more likely to find an overweight one than not. Um, and then the second fact is that that condition, being overweight at all, like moderately overweight, not colossally obese, just like overweight, is worse for a dog than an entire lifetime of smoking is for a human being. It'll shorten their lifespan by something like 20% on average. It's a colossal problem happening to the majority of dogs in the country. And you would think it would be the easiest thing in the world for dog owners to prevent. If you buy the conventional wisdom that calories in and calories out and balancing them is the, the, the fundamental like a uh, way to manage body composition should be the easiest thing in the world, right? You decide exactly how much food your dog is going to get. 
even if you're not somebody that can exercise your dog a ton, you can just scale back the amount of food that you're feeding each day. It shouldn't be a problem. And yet all these dogs are. And so that kind of like fascinated me. And so I was getting this like four hour work week, micro business dog toy company off the ground and also understanding those issues better. And basically by the time, so I got the thing off the ground and uh, was able to quit my job as a lawyer and work on that, you know, full time is not the right way to say it because it was like a micro business type thing. But it's like it ran itself so well that like I needed another professional project while this thing was just kind of spitting out passive income. And I started working on what would become a serious, big, huge book about the problem of obesity. Like I just kind of like started going down the rabbit hole and literally spent the next four years working on this thing that would ultimately become this huge 400 page book that took me all over the country and exposes what I think is a huge, huge problem in how the veterinary community thinks about the problem of obesity. Um, and by that point, I was like fully committed to doggy professional work. And um, yeah, other stuff came from that. It's it's fa it's fascinating because when I was watching the video, so a few things you said, uh, attorneys, you're like, I'm not too sure if you know, I work with attorneys. I have like 28 attorneys. I mean, I have no, nobody has more attorneys in their life than me. I've got attorneys for everything you could possibly imagine, from patents to trademarks to taxes to, you know, to whatever you name it. I bet I've had an, that, that attorney in my life, and I have some very dear friends that are attorneys as well too. And it's true, by the way. If if you're the only source of scalability, then your 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 income is by nature capped, because a you can only have so much time in the day, and b you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, billable hours, if that's how you're doing your business, it's all you're worth is your time. And so micro yeah. businesses, the concept is fa fascinating. So my businesses, I've always done Daniel and Ben software related. So they're SaaS models. So they're people sign up for a service from me and it's repetitive, rev sure. you know, repeat revenue. And sure. that's kind of where you make all the money. And I noticed that's kind of what you did with keto natural pet food. You, you basically, yeah. you came up with this, you came up with the idea that, hey, first of all, you did the studying. And what was the name of the book again? It was Dogs. Uh, what was it? I, man, I, I almost had it. The book is yeah. called Dogs, Dog Food, and Dogma, yeah, exactly. which is a reference to the flawed scientific dogma that is otherwise teaching veterinarians about obesity. Yeah. So when you think about that, Daniel, like the whole podcast that we have here is about championing small guys over the big guys, right? So for all of these centuries, whether it was willful or, willful or, or ignorance, right? The, the, the pet industry has been, in your, from your perspective, preaching one thing about dog's health, which has been doing the exact opposite. I, I think that's happened to us a lot in our own, for humans as well, too, as well. I've always felt better on low-carb diets. The problem is I have a hard time sticking to them and keeping them yeah. because yeah, I yeah, love yeah. French fries. I love yeah. a nice you know sandwich with a piece of bread in between. It's like, you know... I'm Italian in a lot of ways. My grandmother was full Italian, so I like to eat Italian. Yeah. And yeah. so and so it's like the hardest thing to like sustain, but I always feel better. Like when I'm like two weeks, three weeks of low carb, I'm like, oh man, this is this is what I'm supposed to do. And then I just see that pasta bolognese go by me. I'm like, God dang it. I'm just I'm just gonna do me it. Too. I'm but the same way. We're all the same yeah. way. And I and I you know, and I had I have had many dogs throughout my life. I had a dog named Snag, which was named after my mom, Susan, Neil, Adam, and Gary. And then I also had a dog named Ginger, um, which Ginger, for the love of God and country, only would eat one type of dog food. Like we've tried everything you could imagine, but the one that was the worst for her is the one that she wanted. Like, and that was it. Like, <laughs> like we couldn't get her to eat. And like, yeah. so it was the terrible dog food. So when you think about the fact that you have this giant industry and you're this small guy that had a micro business left your lawyer business because you came up with a decent idea to start generating some revenue. And then you realized that there was no place in the market that was serving, you know, um, low carb kibble style food. Cause that's what I th yeah. thought was fascinating. And it reminds me of like the keto cereals I eat sometimes. Yeah. Tell the folks about that, you know, that iteration of where you are now with it and what you decided you had to do because nobody else was doing it. Yeah, so basically there are two main theses that I put forth in the book. Um, number one is that contra to what most pet owners believe and more particularly what most veterinarians believe, the scientific record shows pretty well that the fundamental cause of obesity and other chronic diseases that are common 
and otherwise inexplicable in the Western world among pets is dietary carbohydrate. Basically the carbohydrate is the devil. And so half plus of the book is the scientific, uh, you know, justification, reasoning behind that conclusion. And it's just, this study says this, this works this way, this study says that, blah, blah, blah. The other main thesis of the book is not a scientific one, it's like a kind of cultural, social one, which is the reason that you, me, my vet, et cetera, aren't drinking the Kool-Aid on that issue in the first place, aren't, don't believe that, is because for a long time, big pet food companies that have a very, very vested interest in promoting the healthfulness, the supposed healthfulness of dietary carbohydrate have been hiding the ball, lying, and it's like basically controlling the information environment that we've all been exposed to. And that's the reason that we don't say, oh, obesity is fundamental, a pro fundamentally a problem of carbohydrate intake. So write this book that's got those two main theses. And exactly like you said, if you're somebody who believes those things, either because you read the book and you buy into it or because you came to those opinion, those beliefs on your own through some other mechanism and you're a dog owner and you're like, I need to feed my dog a low carb diet for these reasons. You're, you were not in a great place circa 2016. Yeah. You could either feed it the lowest carbohydrate kibble you could find, which is like 30% plus carbohydrates still, the lo absolute lowest. Most pet food products are 50 to 60%. Yeah. Or you could feed it a non-kibble product. You could feed it a raw diet, fresh diet. And yeah, they're out there and they're good, pro many of them, not all, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just saying raw equals good, but there are plenty of really good raw products. The problem is that like calorie for calorie, like they're, they're unitized really differently than kibble. Like kibble, you know, you sell it in big 20, 30 pound bags that last uh, many dogs like a month or more. The raw products are unitized it completely differently. So the sticker price doesn't like blow you away because it's not a month worth of food at a time, right? But if it was, it would be something like five to eight times as much as like the fanciest kibble you can find. You know what I mean? You're talking about like a big bag of raw would cost you like $600. Jeez Louise. Okay. It's just very expensive as it, cause it's like, you can imagine it's raw. So it's gotta be preserved somehow. So you've got to, you got to either like freeze it and ship it cold or you got to freeze dry it, which is a big intensive process as well. And so it's, it's expensive to make, it's expensive to ship around and it costs the consumer a lot more. And so if you've got a little dog, you know, like you got a 10 pound dog, the difference between fancy kibble for you and raw might be the difference between like 50 cents a day and 250 a day. And like, that might be something you can live with. But right now I am sitting in a home six where dogs. Right outside the other side of the office door, there are six dogs. Two of them are St. Bernard's, okay? So they weigh north of 100 pounds each. One's only six months old and is, is north of 100 pounds. There's a Bernese mountain dog that's, uh, my mother-in-law's dog is like probably 150 pounds. And so just, like the delta between a 10 pound whatever Chihuahua and 150 pound St. Bernard, that's 15 times more food. So that's the difference between call it six or $7 a day for that dog and like 50 plus dollars a day. Yeah, totally. And so for a lot of, it's a complete non-starter for a lot of folks to feed a raw diet. It, it, to it totally is. And Daniel, um, I definitely want to continue this discussion, but I, I'm already late on a break. So we got to get to the break from our corporate sponsor, Anthem Software. We'll be right back. Anthem Business Software System is designed to specifically help small businesses just like yours find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. We do this by providing you with the most powerful software, automations, and marketing services to help your business compete and win in this ever-changing digital world. Take a short video tour at AnthemSoftware.com. And we're back with Daniel and Adam DeGrade talking about dogs, kibble, and low carb. 
It's exactly what we do here on David versus Goliath today. You know, I've had some of the most fascinating people on DVG. I don't know how much you've watched it. Maybe you haven't even watched any. But I mean, we've covered everything from high-end software people to, you know, folks that are making healthy mouthwash to now low-carb diets for dogs. And a matter of fact, uh, you mentioned small dogs before the break. Uh, my wife and I used to have a mini Yorkie. And her name, oh, a her, mini. I didn't even know that was a thing. It, That's got to be like a. She was like three, baby, like three pounds or something or like that. It was. She was so tiny. She was so amazing. She lived long. She lived a long life. Yeah. Um. And she would have been one that we could have fed just about anything. But that dog cost me so much money. It wasn't even funny because <laughs> my wife, who I love dearly, Daniel, wanted to make sure that Godiva had the the nicest surroundings, the nicest yeah. everything, the nicest treatment. And in many respects, she was a princess. And so, you know, therefore, we treated her like one, right? And she was, uh, but you're making a good point. You know, I think back I think back to my cousins who had, you know, a handful of dogs that were big. I mean, that's a huge difference. And so you came up with, yeah. you, you came up with the idea. You, you, you decided you had to do the business. I want to switch to the business gear of this a little bit as well, mm -hmm. too. Because we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs that watch this, a lot of startup entrepreneurs that watch the David versus Goliath podcast. I'm sure we have a ton of dog uh, owners as well, too. But when you came up with the idea and you decided there is a gaping hole in the market and you were going to personally fill that gap. In other words, you were going to go from a micro business to a serious full-time business that you were going to work on mm -hmm. growing and building. You know, mm -hmm. I always talk about five things that make business successful. One is plans with goals. Two is people. Three is technology that we leverage in our business. Four is the process. We all leverage technology in our business. And then five is courage. So starting with plans and goals and the right people. Did you A, do this on your own? B, how much did you plan? And C, how did you get this funded? Go. Uh, as for people and expertise, I, having published a book about what links I believe exist between a dog eating something and a dog developing or not developing a disease, does not mean that I know everything that there is to know or enough even to make kibble products. I know a lot about the nutritional issues going into this process before I founded the company because I spent literally four years working on this book. But there's more to it. Just the like making the product side, making kibble, you, you know, the reason that low carb kibble didn't exist until I came along was because just like bread or cereal or pasta or things that just now are starting to see very low carb keto friendly versions of them. Kibble's basically made the same kind of way historically. Like what kibble is, is just like a meaty version of any one of those things. It's like you mix a bunch of stuff together, including meat in the case of kibble, but you know, not the case in pasta or whatever. And essentially you heat the, these ingredients up. And so they, because there's starch, cause there's carbohydrate in there, when you heat it up, it all holds together. Yeah. Like if you ever try to bake a loaf of bread without using flour, yeah, forget it, it doesn't really work. It falls <laughs> apart. That's like what the flour, the starch does in there is it holds it all together. And so as an engineering matter, making low carb things like that is hard. And so because number one, it's hard. Number two, it's more expensive. A calorie of carbohydrate is far cheaper to, to source than a calorie of meat based protein, like one tenth. And because uh, the, the public had kind of been misled about the healthfulness of these things for so long, there was no like incentive to do it. And so for those three reasons, nobody had ever really set out to do it. And so I basically was like, we're going to give this a good faith shot. I know a lot about the nutritional issues and I know enough about the industry to know who I can partner with to help me get up to speed with doing the rest of it. That was what gave me, that was kind of the loose, like thinking about, okay, how, this is how we're going to get this off the ground. We found formulation partners in the form of veterinary nutritionists and in the form of like kind of food science experts that are more like engineering types and gratefully, vitally a co-manufacturing partner that was willing to take us on when we were super little and had very little money and just a lot of ambition. Um, and uh, we started a one year process of trial and error of like, we'll run, okay, let's, here's the formula. We know it's gonna hit all the nutritional markers we wanna hit, but is it gonna make kibble? Let's find out. We're gonna run a test batch and see how it produces, see how palatable it is. And it basically took us a year of trial and error like that to get it off, the, to, to like, 
create our minimum viable product that we knew dogs like to eat. We knew it hit the nutritional markers we wanted to hit. We could man it, we could deal with, live with the cost to produce it. Um, it was consistent enough to scale. Uh, yeah. And so that was kind of the process of going from zero to minimum viable product about one, one year, 12 months. Now who funded, um, who funded that, who funded that piece? Was that you personally? Friends, family, fools. You know, they had, people had seen me <laughs> Friends, go, family, and fools. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. I mean, know, nobody's ever put it that way. 150 grand total. That was what we needed. You know, we needed my salary, which at that time, which was absolutely nothing. And, um, uh, like enough to produce these test batches. You know, we weren't selling anything at that point. So there was no like- It's all burn. And I didn't- It was all burn it. at that it point. Was all, it was all burning. You're, you were burning money because you were you were developing the product. So it was all burn. Yeah, but it's easier than software because it's like, it, you know, I didn't need uh, employees to write code all day or anything like that. It's like the cost to produce, you know, even when we were trying to get the formula right, like that was sellable product conceivably if it came out right if the nutritional markers hit or whatever that is small production batch that's sellable product it's like something that so anyway yeah it didn't take a ton of money um 150 grand or something like that is what it took to get through the first year and then uh yeah we put it into market in early 2018 and uh, from then uh for the next kind of two years was basically a process of gradually growing it um, and taking on money from folks who were just like increasingly large. Like um, I, my, de my demonstrable success as an entrepreneur and as a bankable, you know, investable person came from the fact that even though our, the micro business was never designed to be something that you put, invest money in and it's going to return 10 X, it, it was still a very hard, I like to believe, very hard thing to do. To create that, I had no money for that. It was all bootstrapped and I made enough that I could leave my job making six figures as a lawyer and pay my bit and still pay my bills just off of this micro business. I was able to be like, I'm going to write a book about a subject that I've got no formal training on whatsoever. I love it. And I'm going to turn it out and it's going to be well received. And I delivered, you know, entirely. Yeah, it's promise. not It's not like it's not like you were a veterinarian. Like you're not. No, I'm not a veterinarian. Yeah, you're not a doctor. And I, and I, I was. But well, what, what you get, but, dude? Here's the thing. So so you, you might have this from if your lawyers are good, you've had this experience. It's like when you when you're a lawyer and you're litigating cases involving technology, you don't go in like some of the cases. You know, you I dealt with very diverse technology depending on who the client is. Like we represented Lockheed Martin sure. in a case involving trade secrets over an aircraft that hasn't been flowed since World War II. <laughs> you know, we represented Cox Communications involving voice over IP technology in, you know, 2010 or something like that. And it's like, I don't know anything about those technologies when the engagement begins. But by the time you're getting to a point where you're litigating that case, yeah, you're, in, an expert. In earnings, you're an expert, you're a pure expert. And you and so you develop a kind of like intellectual hubris behind like, I've learned very complicated scientific stuff. I can learn this. And it gives you the confidence to like, like do it. And then once I got in there, and I realized how much is this an R-rated podcast or is this like a PG podcast? You can say whatever you want. It just will get beeped by my horse <laughs> Once I realized how much horse it was being taught to veterinarians and just how little actual evidentiary backing was behind it, it was like, oh my God, I can, you know, it, it like gave me more confidence. Like I can stand toe to toe with any expert in the world on some of these issues and be able to talk at, you know, be, at, be able to like out debate them essentially, not through being a particularly good debater, but being more knowledgeable about it. I can tell, um, so, I can yeah, tell I mean, that Daniel, if you were one of my attorneys in any litigation that happened, I would like you up there because you're fired up. You're passionate about what you do. You can tell that you're clearly confident. And if you're not, you're going to make it up, which is one of the most successful things that people do. Uh, some of yeah, the, some of the help. most, some of the most profound people that I've ever met that have built products up from nothing are most of the time just making it up as they go along. And, uh, and, but the fact that you did the research, you went out for four years, you wrote the book, you had the confidence, you saw the need, friends, family, and fools uh, helped you develop the actual for formula. And here you are now. Well, with no, a, with they, a, they provided the money. Well, that's really what I mean. Smart that's what I mean. Yeah. Anything but yeah, you, us yeah you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't develop the, develop it without the money. So, you know, that's kind of the way I look at it is that even, even the people that invest in my business, you know, a lot of the software comes from my brain, but I, I couldn't do yeah. it without the people that helped me fund it. Right? Oh, no, I mean, of course. Not. Yeah. They're funding the brain. 
and uh, and so that's that's awesome. So you know when you when you currently right now, what is the size of your team in the business? There are probably uh, so the folks who make our products. So we make a now we have a somewhat significant product line that includes a few different kind, styles of diet, few different styles of supplements and treats. And so we don't own any factories ourselves. Everything that we produce is created by a co-manufacturing partner that makes them to our specifications. And we have different ones depending on the different product. So none of those people are employees of mine. In addition, the same thing applies with regard to distribution. So all we, we don't try to be in any brick and mortar stores at all right now. All we do is sell through e-commerce channels, primarily directly to consumers. Are you doing, so are you doing affiliate? Way, are you doing affiliates? Do we sell through affiliate marketers? Yeah, yeah you, we do. Yeah, I was going to say one of my uh, one of my best friends runs the large one of the biggest affiliate marketing businesses in the world. So I got to make yeah, sure I got to make sure I, I got to make sure I put him in touch with you because um, he's a big plug him here. Huh? Who's that? He's a beast. Uh, it's a okay. company. It's a company called Giddy Up. Um, his okay. name. His name is Topher Grant, and uh, he's an animal in the affiliate world. So you should look him up. Cool. G- Giddy Up. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's part of what we do. I mean, but it's like we do have a a good product for the digital age in the sense that the benefit or the like the nature of the product is substantive. Like what makes it cool and what makes it attractive as a product can be described in words. This is low carb kibble. It's kibble with 80% less carbohydrate than what. So like search-based marketing, paid advertising on Google and Microsoft and platforms like that is that's a really like that's that's our bread and butter. Are there a really? lot people are there a lot of people we're, like, we're, when you first created the product, you know, you think about it cuz there wasn't a lot of alternatives out there. No. So, so when you first created the product, did you have good search volume? In other words, was there a, did you do any research as to whether people were searching for these things beforehand or did you just kind of instinctually know it and go for it and hope the searches were there? Because some people reverse engineer, they go and try to find what are people looking for right now on the internet that's not being served and how can I fill that gap? Or the others is I have a good instinct that this is not being served and they hope that the market then finds them. Was yours a little bit of both or was it one or the other? Yeah, it's a little bit of both is the general answer. The fact that like so many, there was at the time, I published my book in 2016, right? And so by that time, keto meant something for for a lot of average consumers. Like people, there was a low carb, there were people who were low carb people, low carb believers, the way that you at the beginning of the show were like, this makes me feel good. This is definitely a thing. It there does. Were it does. Point, I just wish I could stick to it. Do what? I said, I wish I could stick to it. It does make me feel better, but I just, it's so Yeah, I know. It's, it. it's the same with me. That's how I've become, I, I'm like a big endurance person. I do like endurance sports. That's like one of my hobbies. And so like I run constantly and it's, that's why, like, I believe keto diets are very healthy for me. I do not eat one because partially because it doesn't support that. And then partially because I can, because I run a lot. And, um, but it's like I said, hundred books, easily a hundred books have been written in the human nutrition domain yeah. about keto diets by that point. So there was like a thriving community of low carb people out there. And to me, it was like, yeah, that that instinct that like there's enough of them and 50% of them are dog owners, I'm going to be able to sell to those people was there. There was in the early days, of course, some degree of like empirical approach to it where it's like I could look at Google, the tools that Google makes available and try to understand how many people are probably searching for something like this sure, already. Totally. Yeah. But that, it's more of a um, uh, uh, awareness and education challenge than it is like um brand refinement it's like about edu- like the, the main thrust of being successful in our business is about communicating the value of lo- reducing carbohydrate intake and telling people that we're a, we're a solution for that have you have um, you done any research uh daniel on uh other animals types in other words like um you know cats or you know animals that are kept i can tell you or yeah so here's there's a few things um when it comes to the link between dietary carbohydrate and health uh, diseases, health conditions, health issues, you could frame things like I did at the beginning of the show as a matter of kind of like lifespan. Um, but it's all that's like it requires a little bit of like the reasoning is like low carb diet helps with X disease. X disease tends to shorten lifespan. There's the link between that's the that's how you explain that the benefit there. But the diseases specifically are 
common to both dogs and cats. So obesity, diabetes, cancer are the three primary places where there is at least some degree of evidentiary published peer-reviewed scientific evidence that says carbohydrate is behind this. What I thought was fascinating, so, what I thought was fascinating too, and, and, and like I said, I'm not a, anything that I say here, medical is just always thoughts that I have as a, as a, just as a human. Um, you know, one in three animals or one in three dogs, you said, get cancer in their lifetime. Oh, it's so, hugely common. So I, yeah. I wonder, you know, sometimes I wonder if it's a blend of what they're eating, but also what we're injecting in them throughout their lives or forcing them to take I always wonder, you know, whether it's vaccinations or a shot for this and a shot for that and a medication for this. I mean, I don't know how much research they do on that type of stuff, but we do know that diet definitely has a big impact on it. And it's the same thing with humans, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you have a lifespan and it's not just about living to a certain amount of time. It's also about the quality of life that you get to live during that time. Yeah. And if you have a, a dog or a cat that's overweight, and not healthy, all of that stuff plays in together. So we got to take one more break, and then when we come back, we're going to have some fun and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is courage. You're with Daniel Shuloff, the keto, low-carb dog man, and Adam DeGrade, here your host on the David versus Goliath podcast. Here's another message from a very important sponsor. Stay tuned. Northeast Capital has an exciting new program we offer to equipment and software dealers. It provides you the appearance of a private label captive financing program. We call it Our Financial Services. Using Our Financial Services, you can offer your customers your own financing program, including industry-specific payment calculators and unique payment options. Northeast Capital administers a private label program tailored to you and your customers' needs. Learn how we can help you reduce receivables and qualify for your own private label finance program. segment with Daniel. Uh, Daniel, this has been a lot of fun having you on. I mean, like I said, I had no idea that dogs needed to eat low carb as well as we did. You know, one of the things we talk about here on, on, the, on the podcast, especially, so you, you basically, you had an idea, you, you started a micro business, it supported yourself, you left the business that you weren't really enjoying being in anymore. All of that business life experience that you had as a lawyer, though, gave you the wisdom and talent and the confidence to go and research and present something evidentially with evidence on why this could be potentially healthier. You then realized there was a there was a gap in the market. You got friends, families, and fools to help you believe in that gap as well. They funded it. You worked with really smart people to build a low-carb keto diet. And all of this stuff that people do from that you've gone through from the very first job that you've had to your lawyer experience, to the research that you did, to the fact that you love dog, everything, dogs, everything in your own life leads up to where we are as entrepreneurs, which is, you know what? Not only do I believe I can do it, I'm gonna do it. And there was, because mm -hmm. hesitancy can kill an idea, as you know, action brings life. What was it for you, Daniel, that gave you, you, you know, I know it was a lot of a life experience, but what gave, what was the intangible that said, I not only believe this is going to work, I'm going to make it work and then step out in that faith and do it. Uh, so the, the two things that spring to mind are the first was I, and I, I tell this to like other folks who are looking to make this kind of leap, similar leap to what I made from something that's very consistent and bankable as a job to something that's riskier because it starts with zero. I say this a lot because it was a big meaningful thing for me, is getting psychologically, like authentically comfortable going to zero was a big mental step for me. So being like, okay, if this fails, if I set out to do this and it does not work, what is my life really gonna look like? Let me really try to imagine that and 
make sure that I can live with that. Yeah. If it happens, it's not the desired outcome, but if it happens, can I deal with what that's going to look like? And in my case, what that would look like is probably taking two years of steps back in my career as an attorney, right? Like that's, you know, like anything else, big organization, seniority matters. You move up through the ranks over time, probably going to spend two years on this project and I'm going to have to re-enter the, the, the job pool a couple years back. I do have a graduate degree from a leading institution and a good resume. So I can I will be able to get a job as a lawyer, maybe not at the same, you know, ultra high profile international firm as I was at before, but qu- probably, honestly, like it was sort of like that. And I'll probably have some degree of credit card debt I, and I'll have less savings. You know, it's like I'm going to be starting over somewhat financially, but I wasn't, you know, I was in my uh, late 20s and I came out of graduate school. You know, you have to go to law schools. Like I didn't start working when I was 18 or something like that. It was, And so it wasn't a great deal of that. And so getting comfortable with that, like, okay, what is that going to look like? What is that going to feel like? I was single at that point. I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have other people that were relying on me for my income. And so getting there was like the mental hurdle that I needed to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yours so is purely, it sounds to me like yours was pure, purely rational, but it was rational. I mean, it well, was rational, of, rational to the point though, where you were able to allow yourself to feel what it would have been like yeah, had you yeah. have been in that area. That's what I meant by that. It wasn't purely right. rational in the sense that you had no heart feelings towards it. You rationally right. thought through the worst case scenario, put yourself on the couch as if it just happened and let yourself feel it. And you said, yeah, and, right. you, and you said, can I live with it? And the answer was yes. Now, yeah, now what was that bad? Not that bad. And I tell people, if you're a talented person in general, and if you're, if you're watching and listening to the David versus Goliath podcast right now, and you have a desire and you have an idea and you have something that you haven't done, right? I mean, don't, don't, don't not move forward with that idea in some way. You got to do it. There is a step of faith there. But to Daniel's point, you know, when you do it makes a big difference. How you do it makes a big difference. And your support network makes a big difference. So in Daniel's case, he didn't have a lot of people to worry about because it was himself. And so that's, he had to get to the point where he was on the couch and he was comfortable with the fact that, if I if I if this thing blows up in my face, I can live with it. Now you might be married, you might have kids, you might have other people that are counting on you—a sick relative, a sick mother, or whatever—and that could be holding you back as well too. In that case, you have to go through a different process mentally. But the same process is absolutely something you should do. I love the fact that Daniel went through the intellectual process of what's the worst case scenario, and in in most yeah. cases, when you get there, it's not unlivable. And it's not undoable. So therefore, what are we waiting for? Yeah. At some point, let's jump out and let's do it. That's really great advice, Daniel. Any any other advice that you'd have? Yeah, I mean, the other side of it is a little bit less like laudable, which is like, you know, that at least involves some degree of like forethought and courage. The other side is like sort of just selfish or it's just like, I like challenging stuff. I like big, pre- you know, my hobby is to do these big, super mega endurance races that give me a sense of pride because most people can't do them. You know what I mean? And I like being like, I did this. I'm a badass. And that's sort of that whatever that's driven by insecurity or whatever it is, is a thing for me. And I like the feeling of being like, you know what? You weren't able to do it, but I was. And I'm, I did that. And it felt that way with regard to setting up and starting a business and making it successful as well. I had belief in myself to some degree. I mean, it's like, it's really easy from where I'm sitting right now to be like, I had the intellectual hubris to try it. But it's like that at the mo- in the moment, it's a, it's like, you feel it both ways. It's like to su- some moments I'm feeling very confident that I can do this. Yeah, other moments other you're like, what the heck am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing? And speaking of endurance, yeah. by the way, speaking of endurance, my concept of endurance is a long night out with my wife on the town. Still getting out of bed, walking my 50 yards over here to my gym in my studio and running on an elliptical machine for 45 minutes and trying to do light training on my strength training for 15 minutes. If I could do that three times a week, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. In your case, you're doing Ironman and triathletes and all this stuff like that. So good for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Good for but you. But I, I, I wasn't, I don't have the endurance. I had to give up uh, 
the drinking side, I had to give up drinking. Like I, I can't do that side of it. I don't have the endurance for that. I, I found as I aged, yeah, I couldn't do that. Something's anymore, gotta, now. something's gotta give, right? You can't, you, yeah, yeah, you, can't you, you can't have everything, right? You can't eat candy yeah. and chocolate and vegetables all day long and have that work for you. At some point, one of those has got to go, right? Um, you know, and, and that's probably going to have to be the chocolate, unfortunately. And uh, and the ah, and the yeah, adult see, and the, and the adult. Like I eat. I mean, I say this all the time, and it's like absurd, but like. I eat ice cream every night, literally every night of my life uh, and not like a spoonful. Like I've had my ice cream for the day, like a significant amount of ice cream literally every night of my life. But I just have gotten to a point where I'm doing so much volume when it comes to running. that it's just, yeah, like, it, it seems to me like just looking, just looking at you, Daniel, it looks to me like any calorie that goes in is being burned work. quickly, yeah, yeah. quickly burned in your side. Well, this has been awesome having you on the DVG podcast. Um, how can, yeah, pe- how can people find you, Daniel? Uh, I do maintain an active Twitter handle that is at Daniel Shuloff, but for the most part, my communication stuff is in the pro- professional realm. I love, love doing interviews like this one. Like a big part of what I try to do is I believe that like you should be able to hear from like if I'm I'm not an expert that's like I put out this book and now you're never going to hear from me like I because I don't have the credentialing that veterinarians have. I need to constantly be out there exposing myself to other people's feedback publicly, like letting people ask questions of me, letting people challenge the stuff that I put forth, because otherwise it's it's too easy for people to just be like, that's a crank. He's not like you need to be able to hear it and see it. And so I do a lot of like academic conferences and kind of professional level stuff. But that being said, you can find a lot of podcast stuff. I do maintain a Twitter handle. I don't really I don't think you're going to learn a great deal about me if you follow it. But. If you go to ketonaturalpetfoods.com, you will find a great deal of my writing, speaking, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I saw it. It's a great site. It's well built. It's well laid out. Your video is fantastic. So check it out. Have you had a good time today on the DVG podcast? I've had a wonderful time. This is like, a, yeah, this is, I appreciate so much the amount of energy and forethought. Like, thank you for being thoughtful about doing research ahead of time. I, You've probably been on plenty as an interviewee yourself and like, the difference between a host who's enjoying what they do and is taking the time to get like familiar with, with me as an interviewee is night and day. When somebody hasn't done that, man, that's a tough experience. And somebody's like you, it feels great. So thank you. Well, you're welcome because here at the DVG podcast, what we try to do very, very specifically to the watchers and viewers, as you know, is to provide education, inspiration, and stuff that you can actually activate in your business right here on the David versus Goliath podcast. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.